Chapter Ten of the Friendship of Anne, a story by Ellen Douglas Deland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The evening proved to be one of the most delightful that either Sydney or Elsie had ever passed. They did not have supper until very late, for it was almost eight o'clock when Mrs. Tracy's other sons arrived the trains having been delayed by the storm which continued to rage with unabated fury hugh was older than alec and had just entered harvard law school jim was younger and was at boarding school they all came home to spend thanksgiving with their mother to whom it was easy to see they were devoted treating her with a deference and a courtesy which were charming and at the same time as their best and dearest friend their father had been dead for several years it was certainly a novel and unexpected development in their affairs for sydney and elsie to find themselves in such a household the night before this they had been seated at the long bare table at school dutifully eating their bread and butter and stewed prunes to-night they were guests of a lady whom they both already admired with all the ardor of their schoolgirl hearts for even elsie who did not so easily give her affection as sydney had been won at once by mrs tracy's kindness and hospitality they were seated at a bountiful supper-table in a spacious room where the massive mahogany sideboard and table the quaint high-backed chairs the family portraits on the walls and the dainty silver and glass and china and the soft light shed by the candles in the tall silver candlesticks made the scene a sort of home-like fairyland to them if such an extraordinary combination as home and fairyland can be imagined added to this was the companionship of four boys who appeared to be the nicest and jolliest four boys ever gathered together at one supper table and this wonderful change in the fortunes of sydney and elsie had been brought about by being caught in a snowstorm what are you thinking about miss stuart asked alec i have been watching you and you haven't said anything for five minutes and you look as if you were pondering affairs of state i was thinking what a lucky thing it was that elsie and i went to walk this afternoon and that we didn't take our muffs if we had muffs elsie's hands wouldn't have been cold and she wouldn't have fainted and you wouldn't have brought us here instead of taking us back to the school and oh everything would have been horrid instead of simply perfect as it is they all laughed at her enthusiasm the moral of it is never carry a muff said alec and the best part of it all is added sydney that mrs tracy didn't talk alphabetically why we could discuss zebras if we wanted to what on earth do you mean and why should you want to discuss zebras asked hugh i don't i never thought they were in the least interesting but you know miss wickersham has a new topic for every night and we think she goes straight through the alphabet when you are obliged to discuss something beginning with a g for instance you long to change the subject and bring up zebras zebras would be hard for me to talk about as anything else remarked elsie mournfully i don't seem to know a thing about any subject miss wickersham chooses last night it was glaciers she must have felt the approach of the storm and the cold wave said hugh laughing what on earth did she say about glaciers oh she discoursed about them and i must confess i didn't half listen and then when she pounced on me and asked me what was the most remarkable fact in connection with them 
I couldn't think of anything to say except they were composed of ice. Did anybody answer right? asked Jim, who was deeply interested. Yes, of course. Bertha Macy did, said Sydney. She always says the right thing. Yes, said Elsie. She is Miss Wickersham's favorite scholar, for that very reason. She told about the slow movement of glaciers, and she knew all about somebody's husband who was lost in one, and twenty years later the wife went to the place in the Alps and waited, and presently around came the glacier and her husband was in it. Alive? asked Jim in awestruck tones and then was overwhelmed by the roar of laughter from his brothers and Miriam. you silly they cried oh you little tiny kid what kind of school do you go to anyway the same one you went to yourselves retorted jim and i must say you're not much of an advertisement for st paul's so bertha macy is a favorite is she said mrs tracy a moment later when the laugh had again subsided i had a note from anne to-night brought by thomas when he came with your bags asking me if she could bring her to-morrow night of course i am very glad to have her do so the more the merrier is the rule in the house elsie i want you to be here too now my dear don't say you can't for we all know you can we will settle all that to-morrow morning how does anne get along in the conversation at supper asked alec does she know anything about glaciers or zebras she is always very bright and says something funny said elsie after waiting a moment for sydney to speak sydney however was silent and her face had grown scarlet of this she was perfectly well aware which naturally made her blush more deeply than ever until her crimson cheeks were noticeable to every one jim stared at her and with the candor of the small boy was about to comment upon it but alec diverted his mind by a timely allusion to football as played at st paul's school privately alec was wondering what the trouble was he had already noticed that whenever Anne's name had been mentioned, Sidney Stewart had appeared very much embarrassed. Alec Tracy was a young man of keen power of observation, and very little escaped him. Nothing more was said on the subject, for Mrs. Tracy began to speak of something else, and Sidney's cheeks had time to cool. In the evening, games were played until bedtime and then the girls were taken by mrs tracy to the guest room in which she had already established them i hope you will rest well in my old four-poster she said as she bade them good night i can't tell you how pleased i am to have you here i want you to stay with me until the day after tomorrow i will make it all right with miss wickersham you must just make up your minds to be my guests until friday morning good night my dears she left them without giving them time to reply what are we to do about it elsie asked sydney sitting in the big chintz covered rocking chair and looking very anxious or rather what am i to do about it it is all right for you to stay but how can I without explaining, or something? Mrs. Tracy will think it so queer when Anne gets here and is so cool and distant, the way she has been lately. Elsie surveyed her friend for an instant without replying. Then she began to brush her hair with a vigor that bade fair to pull it out by the roots. You made me mad, she said at last. Why, Elsie, exclaimed Sidney, much amazed. Yes, you made me mad. I think you are a perfect goose. I should like to know why, said Sidney, 
with as much dignity as she could muster when on the verge of tears well i will tell you why elsie ceased brushing and her hair which was very thick hung like a bush around her face here we are in this perfect house with that dear perfect mrs tracy doing everything for us and those nice boys and everything lovely and you go and make yourself miserable over anne what anne thinks and does and says and what she is going to think and do and say what difference does it make anyway you know you haven't done anything wrong whatever the trouble is that all of this fuss is about there doesn't seem to be anything very wicked i am sure i can't believe you have done anything dreadful or you would be the very one to own up to it you are making a terrible mystery of whatever you think it is but if you must do that why you must but as to being in such a state about anne and whether she is going to like your being here why i think it isn't worth while let her come and be cool if she wants to who cares just be independent i am sure i should not be so much affected by any girl's opinion no matter how fond i was of her do get up a little spirit sydney don't be such an idiot sydney was so surprised by the sudden attack that she forgot to be angry at one time she had been very near crying but that danger was successfully passed and then the excellent sense of elsie's remarks gradually became evident to her after all why should she care so much if she had done nothing wrong why should she tremble so beneath anne's displeasure she would not she rose from the rocking chair and cast her arms about elsie's neck you are perfectly hateful to scold so but a dear all the same she said i believe i will take your advice good said elsie very much pleased she was afraid she had said almost too much in her zeal and she was greatly relieved to find that sydney took it so good-naturedly when they awoke the next morning it was still snowing but by eleven o'clock it ceased and there were signs of clearing it had drifted badly and lay in great masses against the windows on one side of the house and was on a level with the fence in some places while in others there was not so much to be seen the boys were out early digging paths and investigating the state of affairs as far as they could penetrate they reported the worst storm they had ever known in which thomas agreed with them no one had passed the house as yet and it would be impossible to go over the road until it was broken out by the town sledges which were always sent out with oxen and men in such times as these the girls went out for a time and did some digging and snowballing but it was very cold and they were not sorry to come indoors and help mrs tracy with her preparations for the evening she was an old-fashioned housekeeper and when company was expected she washed the extra china and silver herself and in this she was glad to have the assistance of the two young girls now i suppose you will wish to get your best frocks or whatever you intend to wear tonight she said when the last cup had been carefully wiped and the last fork placed with its mates in the silver basket the sun seems to be trying to break through the clouds now and i have no doubt that it will clear within an hour or so snowstorms don't last very long which is fortunate when they are as bad as this but the question of getting over the road to the school is a serious one we will have the sleigh out this afternoon and see what can be done if we can't get there 
you will have to contend yourself with what you have on you both look very nice and i can lend you some bits of lace and tulle to wear around your necks it was quite the fashion in those days for even very young girls to turn their collars and wear folds of white tulle or a lace fichu crossed in front when they wished to appear a little more elaborately dressed in the evening thus making themselves look years older than girls of the present day of the same age anne talbot was an object of the envy and admiration of the whole wickersham school because she had a blue silk dress with a train and although simply made the waist was cut in the style described sydney and elsie knew that she intended wearing this gown to the thanksgiving party and naturally were anxious to dress as well as they could themselves so they hoped that it would be possible to reach the school and procure their possessions the thanksgiving turkey with all its attendant good things was eaten at one o'clock an early hour being chosen in order that there might be time for something of a sleigh ride before dark the big three-seated sleigh with two horses came to the door as soon as dinner was eaten and well wrapped up in fur garments the party set forth each seat held three persons comfortably and mrs tracy's plan was to go to the school and ask anne talbot to take the sleigh ride with them while at the same time sydney and elsie could get what they needed for the evening when they reached the schoolhouse she went indoors with them to explain matters to mrs wickersham it was always impossible to resist mrs tracy's appeals and miss wickersham agreed at once to all that she desired so that the girls went up to their rooms and anne was sent for to come to the parlor and see her cousin she ran downstairs upon receiving the summons and met the girls as they were going up hola anne said sydney pleasantly we've had the greatest adventures did you hear how we were caught in the storm and your cousin rescued us and drove us home yes said anne without stopping she scarcely looked at sydney and said no more she continued on her way to the parlor miss wickersham excused herself when she came in and anne was left alone with her cousin she hardly spoke to me whispered sydney as they continued on their way to their rooms her eyes were full of tears well what of it don't forget you made up your mind about last night just don't care elsie's tone as she gave these orders was severe but it is easier for some people to resist from caring than it is for others while sydney's common sense told her that elise's advice was excellent her warm and loving nature suffered keenly however she hastily dried her eyes before many tears had had time to gather and went to her room fortunately bertha macy was not there she was so occupied with her preparations for the evening and with her thoughts about anne that she did not notice the changed aspect of the room until she was about to leave it then she suddenly discovered that it looked different the other table was empty and so was the bureau which had been bertha's her pictures and books were gone in fact there was nothing to be seen which belonged to bertha what could it mean sydney scarcely dared hope that bertha had been given another room but it certainly seemed so she went out into the corridor carrying the box in which she had packed her dress and met elsie who was also laden with a box good exclaimed elsie you must be glad and so am i what about why haven't you heard bertha macy has been moved to julia clark's room 
and where is julia's roommate going she hasn't any the girl who was there mary allen has gone home and isn't coming back you know she hasn't been well and they suddenly decided to take her out of school i believe they have been thinking about it but mary herself didn't know it until yesterday and she left just after dinner miss wickershams are worried for fear she was blocked up in the storm bertha asked right away if she could be moved to julia's room and miss wickersham said she could she would let bertha do anything said sydney well i am glad and you suppose i shall have a room all to myself now i don't know said elsie she had hoped that sydney would wish her to come to it evidently this idea did not come to her certainly elsie would not suggest it herself there was no time for further conversation for mrs tracy was waiting for them when they entered the parlor anne immediately rose good-bye cousin gertrude she said we will be there in good time for supper we are going to have a sleigh from the livery stable to take us and come for us i am sorry you will not go this afternoon said mrs tracy her face was graver than usual and her voice was not very cordial she was evidently displeased about something oh you have plenty without me said anne lightly but it was good of you to ask me she left the room mrs tracy said sydney impulsively i suppose anne is not going slaying because i am i don't know for certain what all the trouble is but anne is very angry with me about something and i think it is something which i can't very well explain but she ought to be the one to go with you and not i for she is your cousin now do take her and let me stay at home please do i shall not do anything of the kind said mrs tracy you and elsie are already my guests and i am delighted to have you i wanted anne too if she chooses to stay at home she has a perfect right to do so but i shall certainly not urge her to come don't think anything more about it sydney i suppose it is a girl's quarrel of some sort and it will all be smoothed over in time don't worry if you can tell me your side of it perhaps i can straighten the matter out when we get home there may be a chance for us to talk but now we must go for the boys will think we are never coming they were received by the boys with loud exclamations of reproach we thought wicky must have gobbled you up for her thanksgiving dinner said alec very audibly my dear boy she will hear you remonstrated his mother but where is anne he demanded she can't come slaying but she will be with us to-night can't come slaying i wonder what's in the wind i never knew anne to decline a sleigh ride before and anne from an upper window watching the party drive away was almost sorry that she had not yielded to her cousin's persuasions it is such fun to go with the tracy boys she said to herself and fred merriman too it is too bad but of course i couldn't feeling as i do about sydney it would not be right if she had only owed up to everything i might have forgiven her but i simply can't have anything to do with a girl who is so awfully dishonorable it is as much as i can do to go to cousin gertrude's tonight but there will be so many there i shan't have to have anything to do with sydney it would be different on a sleigh ride i might have to sit next to her what a great piece of luck it was for those two girls to get caught in the storm yesterday and be rescued by alec and taken to that house 
End of chapter 10. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 11 of The Friendship of Anne. A story by Ellen Douglas Delane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It must not be supposed that Anne's resentment against Sydney was entirely due to the receipt of the anonymous letters. There had been other forces at work, and new developments had taken place. Since Sydney and Elsie went out to walk the day before, there had been ample time for much gossip and for any amount of mischief to grow and flourish. The girls had all been kept in the house by the storm. The fact that Bertha Macy had asked to have her room changed because she did not care to share one with Sydney was a piece of news of great interest to everyone. Bertha had merely stated to Miss Wickersham that she was so fond of Julia Clark that she would like to room with her, and Miss Wickersham, after very little hesitation, had granted her request. There was no doubt that Bertha was a favorite with the principal. To the girls she had said very little more, but the tone of voice that one uses makes a deep impression, and the slightest of insinuations can gain the importance of an established fact when the speaker intends to have it so, and the person addressed is looking for evidence of trouble. I am so glad to have the chance to change my room, Bertha said to a group of girls whom she met in the corridor, when she and Julia were engaged in removing her possessions from one room to another. Of course I am awfully sorry for poor Mary Ellen, though even if she is sick it is not altogether bad luck to have to go home but it is splendid for me oh if you knew what i have had to go through well i don't believe one of you would have stood it as long as i have of course i have felt very sorry for sydney because she seemed so poor she is here at half rates i know for certain that is exactly the way it is half rates she must be positively impetuous the girls all thought this a most impressive word and admired bertha accordingly but when people are poor because somebody has done something dreadful you can't feel so sorry it may seem surprising that bertha macy had gained such influence while Sidney Stewart so quickly became the object of suspicion and dislike. But such was the case, and it was not an unusual one. Little circumstances and tiny events often seem to produce startling results. Bertha was not unpopular with many of the girls, and she had a warm friend in Julia Clark. Together they were of some importance, and the fact that Bertha was liked by Miss Wickersham added to her standing in the school. The other teachers did not care for her, but Miss Wickersham's opinions of the girls were always affected by their ability as scholars. Bertha Macy was exceedingly clever at her lessons, as well as in other ways, and therefore Miss Wickersham felt that Bertha was a distinct ornament to her school. And so all this trouble, taking its rise from a very small beginning, grew and prospered until it became of amazing proportions. The hour for supper at Mrs. Tracy's on this Thanksgiving night was seven o'clock. When the sleighing party returned it was already dark, and after the cold ride they were glad enough to gather round the big fireplace where great logs were crackling, the bright blaze of which made the room warm and cheerful. By this time Sidney and Elsie felt completely at home, and the cordial and hospitable spirit shown to them 
by mrs tracy and the boys had the effect of bringing out all that was sweet and attractive in both the girls they were perfectly unaffected and sincere and therefore made a most favorable impression upon their hostess who was charmed with them and really glad to have them in the house and hugh alec and fred merriman agreed in pronouncing them the nicest most natural and altogether the jolliest girls they had met for a long time this opinion pronounced with an air of finality and with the knowledge of the world possessed by three harvard students who considered themselves thoroughly experienced in the way of girls would no doubt have been extremely flattering to sydney and elsie had they but known it after half an hour's chat by the fire they dispersed to prepare for the evening and they were all ready when at a few minutes before seven the first sleigh drew up at the door very soon another and then another came and presently all of the guests had arrived besides the girls who were at boarding school there were two frances dunn and bessie hastings who lived in kingsbridge and attended the wickersham school as day scholars and who therefore were already acquainted with the other girls a number of young men who were at home from harvard or yale or williams friends of the tracys and who also lived in kingsbridge had been bidden and it was therefore a large and merry party of eighteen which sat down to supper and such good things as they had to eat there were broiled chickens and oysters and salad and waffles and biscuits and ice cream and cake in fact everything that everybody liked best and which the boarding school girls appreciated to the utmost sydney had been placed on the same side of the table with anne talbot but at such distance from her that conversation with her was out of the question and as bertha macy was equally far away on the other side there was no awkwardness she had determined to forget all unpleasant feeling and to do her very best on mrs tracy's account to help make the evening as pleasant as possible in the meantime bertha macy was enjoying herself thoroughly to be invited to mrs tracy's thanksgiving party had seemed to her the summit of all that it was possible to wish for and she had written a triumphant letter to her sister announcing that at last she had reached the goal of her aspirations everything is going all right she wrote anne talbot evidently wants me for her most intimate friend for she has asked mrs tracy to have me at her party the tracys are the very nicest people in kingsbridge and the boys are perfectly elegant they are stunning to look at and as for alec the second one he is just too handsome for anything with beautiful light hair and stunning blue eyes all the girls are crazy about him and fred merriman keeps everybody laughing he is perfectly fascinating the idea of that horrid little sydney stuart staying in the house and elsie brent of all people but perhaps it is just as well for mrs tracy will soon find out how common they are and will probably never ask them again i am going to wear my white tulle and i keep my hair up in papers every minute that i can be in my room and have them under my hat when i am out as much as possible it is provoking that i have to take it down at all but miss wickersham does not allow curl papers at meals or lessons the result of these plans and this vigilance as to her hair was that bertha appeared at mrs tracy's looking not unlike a waxen image 
that one sees in the window of a hairdresser's establishment in fact fred merriman asked alec in a solemn whisper if he knew the best place for buying wigs you'll soon need one my boy for you are daily growing older and some day you will lose your hair and be bald and the wax doll over there is evidently in the wig business ask her but alec hushed him up and repaid him by introducing him to bertha as soon as possible her light hair was in ringlets and curls and puffs her frizzy bang standing out like a ruffle all around her face which would have been pretty had it not been for the peculiarly shrewd expression of her eyes she was very much overdressed and in this was in marked contrast to the other girls but fortunately for her she was perfectly satisfied with her own appearance and the stare of curiosity and astonishment which fred merriman made little effort to disguise she took for one of admiration poor bertha had not had many advantages in the matter of bringing up thus far in her intercourse with the girls at school she had not shown very conspicuously her lack of gentle breeding but now her thin veneering of good manners could not stand the strain put on it a girl among other girls is not so much noticed as a girl among boys it is then she proves whether or not she is a lady bertha was blissfully ignorant of the fact that there was no sterner critic of the girl's behavior than the fascinating fred merriman he was quite willing to go himself as far as any girl would allow but he reserved the right of judging her both he and alec were extremely particular in this respect and were equally scathing in their comments to each other they enjoyed carrying on as it was called with anybody and everybody but the girls whom they considered their friends must be nice in every way so bertha simpered and smiled when fred was introduced to her and informed him as promptly as possible that she had long known him by sight and had been simply dying to meet him how awfully kind of you said fred at once assuming his most devoted manner which he knew how to use to perfection if i had only known that i might have been saved many an hour of despair his face was intensely solemn and his gray eyes gazed sadly at his victim really she said eagerly have you known me by sight and she paused and wished to meet you how could anything else be possible miss macy could such a striking looking person as you pass unnoticed do i look like a blind man i ask you now as friend to friend do my eyes give you the impression of not seeing you bertha beneath their gaze cast down her own eyes and giggled not from amusement for she was lacking in humor but from pleasure it is funny what a small place the world is she remarked she had heard older persons make this statement and it seemed to fit this occasion to a nicety people are destined to meet sooner or later and it is brought about so strangely we both live in new york and have probably met in the street ever so many times and yet we have to come all the way to kingsbridge to be actually introduced oh dear me they are going to play games aren't they don't you hate games loathe them do you suppose we have to play couldn't we go sit somewhere else before they ask us delighted to i am sure replied merriman the stairs are always available oh 
I love sitting on the stairs. Let's do it. To hear is to obey. Your wishes are as law to me, Miss Macy. Oh, Mr. Merriman, you treat me like a queen, said Bertha, whose head was now quite turned by the attention which she felt must be noticed by every one of the other girls. To hear these speeches from Fred Merriman of all persons, and his manner was so devoted. She rose promptly as she said, this and you are not a queen said he your name should be rose the queen among flowers he added when they reached the stairs and sat down what is your first name bertha i wish you would call me bertha miss macy is so formal and i really feel as if i had known you always i should judge so said merriman growing more and more solemn in appearance inwardly he was indulging in unrestrained mirth great scott he said to himself the girl will swallow anything and here i am stuck on the stairs with her for the evening unless someone comes to help me out but i'll get some fun out of it anyway so he continued his fun until some time later when the sounds of reverie from the parlor which he was missing became more than he could endure then he rose to his feet i must take you back said he i have no right to keep you out here in my dreary company when everyone else is laughing oh i don't want to go play games said bertha and as for your being dreary the idea you are not at all dreary and i just love talking and when you meet someone who thinks just as you do about everything alec exclaimed fred merriman catching a glimpse of his friend's light head as he at that moment peered out of the parlor door alec alec came forward my dear fellow said merriman clutching the banisters you are just in time take miss macy into the parlor will you one of those attacks i sometimes have i feel it coming on don't worry miss macy it is not your fault at all you couldn't help it i am subject to them i need air alec understands alec surveyed him severely yes i do understand said he miss macy he will come round all right if we leave him here he just needs to be alone he'll bob up again serenely pretty soon anne was just asking where you could be they are getting up charades there was nothing for bertha to do but go with him is mr merriman not strong she asked poor fellow it seems drearful to leave him alone if he is ill or faint or anything it is just an attack of weakness exclaimed alex extreme weakness the only thing to do is to leave him alone and fred left alone rolled on the stairs in the ecstasy of his mirth a little later he entered the parlor he walked slowly and his face was grave one quick glance showed him where bertha was and he turned the other way and took a seat by elsie brent there were to be some impromptu charades and all were waiting for the folding doors between the rooms to be opened on the first scene fred after a remark of no importance was silent he was pondering something which bertha had said and he planned a test for each of the girls he intended he told himself to find out exactly what each of these wickersham girls was like i have been talking a long time with miss macy he said by way of opening his campaign charming creature elsie looked at him and laughed 
she already understood precisely what his air of solemnity and his extravagant language meant don't you agree with me he asked why do you laugh because you are so amusing but isn't she charming why of course i told you she was miss wickersham's favorite but is she a favorite of yours i have another favorite you cannot have more than one i know they are rare but sometimes you can have two i suppose yours is miss stuart a good guess said elsie laughing again she had an unaffected hearty laugh that was pleasant to hear then she changed the subject she would not discuss bertha macy with him a little later he sauntered over to sydney stuart i have been talking for ever so long with a friend of yours he said you mean elsie no not miss elsie i mean miss macy oh she isn't a friend of mine began sydney impulsively at least that is why you astonish me aren't all the girls at the wiki school friends we ought to be said sydney quickly recovering herself bertha is a very bright girl at lessons she is a perfect wonder in mathematics mathematics are always charming observed merriman i have no doubt they are said sydney demurely as for myself i don't know how to add so of course i admire bertha macy for the way she does it i suppose you and she have been discussing geometrical problems of course and we have also dabbled in arithmetic she has been explaining to me that two and two make four how interesting now i couldn't possibly have told you that it is too bad you don't like her miss stuart birds in their little nests should always agree why i have never said i didn't like her she is considered very pretty and very clever if bertha and i were birds and lived in a nest instead of a boarding school i'm sure we should agree beautifully unless she happened to be an english sparrow and you were a well we will say a bluebird i am more like a sparrow said sydney laughing as she glanced at her dress bertha is a peacock whispered fred oh no not at all i was going to say a gay beautiful baltimore oriole well that will do they are forever chattering sydney looked him straight in the eye her own were reproving do you think you are nice to make fun of her to me for you are making fun of her i would rather you didn't fred's expression changed instantly i beg your pardon he said you are right and presently they were talking gaily about other things and then the doors opened upon the first scene of the charade i just tell you what it is said he later to alec and hugh when the guests had gone the household was supposedly asleep and the three boys in the den upstairs were talking things over these two girls who are staying here are the real thing i couldn't get them to say a word against the macy girl she had been hammering against them for all she was worth she told me the greatest lot of trash said all sorts of mean things about sydney stuart and her family and her affairs i won't repeat them it takes a girl to say mean things about another girl that is just why i tried to draw out the other two to see whether they were anything like the same kind you might have spared yourself the trouble said alec you might have known they are ladies well of course i knew that 
but even ladies sometimes say disagreeable things when there is any fuss going on and that there is some kind of fuss i am sure but they both kept as quiet as mice on the subject oh that macy she really thought i meant it when i called her a queen among flowers and on the strength of it asked me to call her by her first name she's a daisy i never knew the daisy was a queen among flowers observed hugh pensively what may i ask does she call you is it already freddy no but it might have been if i hadn't been firm oh my eye my little little eye she's a daisy and again he had one of his attacks of weakness in which the others joined End of chapter 11 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number 12 of the friendship of anne a story by ellen douglas deland this librivox recording is in the public domain school life seemed very humdrum to sydney and elsie after their visit to mrs tracy's but the change had been good for sydney she no longer took such a gloomy view of the situation she felt that she had made friends at kingsbridge if not in the school itself mrs tracy said a few words to her when they were alone together for a moment just before her return which had been particularly comforting my dear said the older woman i have enjoyed your visit you must tell your mother from me that i hope to make her acquaintance some day and in the meantime sydney if you need my advice or any help from me of any kind i should be so glad to do anything that i could with your mother so far away you might wish to talk with an older friend older in years i mean than those at school perhaps i could help you more than one of the teachers could just come to me whenever you want to and don't worry about any trouble with anne i know my young cousin very well she goes to great extremes and will certainly come around in time and do everything to atone for her coldness now just wait patiently i will give you a verse to remember when friendship wields the sword lay bare the breast and wait love conquers love but hate has never conquered hate so sydney went back with renewed courage and tried not to allow herself to be affected by anne's chilling manner and the less disguised hostility of many of the other girls before many weeks came the christmas holidays to her great disappointment and grief sydney found it would not be possible for her to go home mrs stuart felt that she could not afford to let her take the expensive journey much as she herself longed to see her daughter there was no help for it and sydney was forced to make up her mind to stay where she was and to see all of her schoolmates pack their trunks with joyful eagerness and prepare to go to their homes to pass the holidays it was hard as every girl will agree not only must she listen to their plans and projects for fun their ardent anticipations of christmas but she also had to endure their ill-concealed surprise that she was to remain there and her certainty of their criticisms she heard julia clark say one day she must have a very queer mother not to let her come home to spend christmas the whole family must be queer there is something and then julia broke off with exaggerated caution when she discovered or appeared to discover that sydney was within hearing sydney was quite sure however that julia knew it when she began to speak 
on the whole it was a relief when the barge now on runners carried the travellers at last started for the station and she was left alone with the three misses wickersham to pass the ten days of vacation as best she might it was the saturday before christmas which fell on a tuesday this year and the pupils were not to return until the second of january mrs tracy and her family had gone to spend christmas with some of their relatives who lived in boston and there was no one outside of the school to whom sydney could turn she felt very lonely and very miserable and having watched the barge drive away amid the jingling of sleigh bells and the joyful shouts of the girls she went to her room locked the door and threw herself on the bed and indulged in what is known as a good cry when she had cried until her eyes were smarting and her head ached and there were no tears left to shed she told herself that she might be better employed and by way of finding something more desirable to do she got up and went to the window now it happened to use a common expression but little things that lead to great ones can scarcely be attributed to chance it happened that just as sydney reached the window and red-eyed and teary glazed idly down into the braithwaite garden next door just at that moment the little lady who lived there came into sight among the trees the garden paths had been shoveled out and she was in the habit of taking daily exercise there always before this she had been under the care of the elderly maid who attended her closely it was said among the girls that she was blind and that this was the reason she was always seen leaning on the maid's arm certainly she had never walked there alone before sydney watched her at first with languid curiosity and presently with more marked interest the little lady as she was called was evidently in difficulty she seemed to be confused and after having at first walked with the aid of her cane in the middle of the broad path was now wandering from side to side she stepped into the deep snow and then hastily turning found herself in a worse predicament on the other side of the path in a moment she had fallen sydney whose anxiety about her neighbor's movements had been rapidly increasing now turned from the window with an exclamation of dismay and hurried from the room she ran quickly downstairs and out into the garden remembering the corner of the wall where she had climbed over once before she waded and plunged through the snow until she reached it and very soon she was on the other side and making her way to the spot where she had seen the little lady fall she found her still on the ground is that you eliza murmured the blind woman i could not wait for you and came out alone and i have fallen eliza you see i am quite in the snow can i help you asked sydney what it is not eliza it is a younger voice i am sure if you would be so good the lady stretched out her hands with the long delicate fingers which sydney could feel even through the woolen gloves and presently she was standing while sydney brushed the snow from her skirts and even from her shoulders she wore the scarlet cape and hood which could be so plainly seen from the schoolhouse windows and which sydney had so often watched i hope you are not hurt said the girl the snow is very soft here but the fall must have jarred you only a little i was frightened that is all said mrs braithwaite you are very kind to help me where did you come from did you drop from the skies in time to pick up a poor blind woman sydney laughed i am at the school next door and i was just looking out my window 
I saw you fall, so I ran down and climbed over the wall. May I help you back to the house? If you will be so good. I needed fresh air so badly, and Eliza was so long in coming back from the town. I hope you are not hurt in any way, said Sydney, looking down at the little figure beside her, as they walked slowly towards the house. Oh, no, I was a little startled, that is all, and cold, for I could not get up, that is, I was afraid to rise lest I might do myself some harm among the trees and bushes. Eliza will scold me, she added apprehensively. She will not like it at all. I wonder, now perhaps you will do me another kindness, or is it asking too much? I should love to do anything, said Sydney, growing every moment more interested in and more fascinated by the strange little blind woman. What would you like? Well, my dear, it is for you to take me back to the house and upstairs and my things off before Eliza comes back. Then she won't scold. Indeed, she will never know I have been out without her. And Eliza can be so severe. A good creature Eliza is, kind as possible, but at times a trifle severe. So they walked along the path to the front of the house, and then for the second time in her life, Sydney opened the front door of Braithwaite Hall and went in, this time with its owner leaning on her arm. "'We will go right upstairs,' said the little lady. "'I do not need your assistance now, though it is pleasant to have such a strong young arm to lean upon.' My dear boy's arm was strong and firm. I like the young. Ah, yes, it is good to be young, and if we can no longer be that ourselves, we have the young near us. And since my dear boy was taken from me, I have had no one. Eliza is a good creature, but old, so old. While she talked, she stepped briskly through the hall and mounted the stairs, Sydney following. She led the way to the large, beautiful room where the piano was and threw open the door. Do you care for music? she asked in a strange, abrupt way. Tell me the exact truth. Does music speak to your soul? I, I scarcely know, stammered Sydney. I heard you play and I loved it. Ah, you have heard me play? But why do you not know if it speaks to your soul? Here, let me touch your face. She passed her hand gently over the girl's face. You are too young. That is it. You have not yet learned. It is good to be young and to be with the young, but only those who have lived can understand what music is. Here, take my hood and cloak and kindly lay them in that chest of drawers beside the window over there. The hood in the second drawer, the cloak in the third, folded so. She deftly smoothed the red cloak. Now Eliza will never guess that I have been out, and now I will play for you. Sydney did as she was told. Mrs. Braithwaite seated herself at the piano, and after a few preliminary chords, she passed into a quaint simple air in a particular tempo. Do you like that? she asked. Tell me the truth. Does it appeal to you? I love it, said Sydney in a low voice. She stood by the piano. Then I shall love you, said the musician. It is a Christmas carol. A very old carol and I always played it for my dear boy he loved it this is the beautiful Christmas time and I no longer have my boy but I can play the music he cared for some day I will tell you all about him you will come again to see me indeed I will if you want me 
I am sure Mrs. Wickersham will allow me to, if you really would like it. I should, and I think Eliza wouldn't mind. We will speak of it when she comes in. I have heard you all in there. I have listened to your young voices. Ah, it is good to hear the young. I like boys the best, but you are a nice girl, I am sure. Now I will play some more. And Sydney listened entranced while the wonderful music filled the room, called forth by the slim, delicate fingers of the little lady of Braithwaite Hall. Presently the music ceased with a suddenness that was startling. In the distance could be heard approaching a heavy footstep. Eliza is coming, said Mrs. Braithwaite, in a low voice. You needn't mind her. She is a good soul, Eliza is, but so old and a trifle severe. The footsteps drew nearer, and in a moment Eliza entered the room. She was the woman who Sydney had so often seen in the garden with Mrs. Braithwaite, a thick-set elderly woman of middle height, with a pale square face, the lower part of which gave the effect of harshness. But her eyes were kind. She had removed her outer garments and wore a large white apron over her dark dress. Her hair was not gray, but she was no longer young. She looked at Sydney with undisguised surprise. Eliza, began Mrs. Braithwaite eagerly, this young lady is calling on me. I don't know your name, my dear, but you shall tell me the next time you come, for I want her to come again, Eliza. She likes music, and you are so often busy, Eliza. It will give you more time for your cleaning and cooking. Eliza said nothing, but she nodded her head slightly in response to the introduction and surveyed Sydney from head to foot with a critical gaze. I will come again with pleasure, said the girl, if Miss Wickersham is willing, and I am sure she will be. All the other girls have gone home for the holidays, but I couldn't. I half had to stay here. I must go now, or Miss Wickersham will wonder what has become of me. My name is Sydney Stewart. Her eyes, as she said this, chanced to be resting upon Eliza. The woman was looking at her mistress. Her face changed suddenly, and she started forward as if to catch Mrs. Braithwaite in her arms. Sydney turned quickly and looked at the little lady. She had grown very pale, and certainly her face, too, had undergone some undescribable change. What name did you say? she faltered. Could I have heard all right, or did my ears deceive me? Sydney Stewart, repeated the girl, wondering at the strange effect of her words. And where do you live? In New York, in the city of New York, I mean. Ah, then it is just a coincidence. The name of Stuart has peculiar associations in my mind. Goodbye, my dear. Come again. I shall call you by your first name. Eliza, his name was Stuart. You remember. I will lie down now. I won't go out again. Again? You haven't been out of doors today, ma'am. We will go this afternoon. I am too busy this morning. Very well, Eliza, this afternoon. She turned her sightless eyes towards Sydney, and a gleam of amusement passed over her delicate face. Thank you, my dear, for your kindness to me. Good morning. Sydney went downstairs and left the house. She returned to the school by way of the road. Her mind was absorbed by this remarkable adventure, as she called it. She determined to tell Miss Wickersham all about it as soon as possible, and asked permission to go very soon again to see their mysterious neighbor. The probability of Eliza's disapproval was the only obstacle to her going there as often as she wished, she thought. 
Eliza was certainly severe. She forgot her loneliness and her troubles in her new interest. Naturally enough, as she was the only girl left at the school, she was thrown into more intimate companionship with Mrs. Wickersham. It would have been impossible for Miss Wickersham herself to be intimate with anyone, but Miss Abby and Miss Jenny were more genial. They were greatly interested in her account of the rescue of Miss Braithwaite from the snow drifts, and willingly consented to Sydney's proposition that she should go in to see their neighbor again. I shall go myself, said Miss Wickersham. During the holidays I shall have time for it. I have been intending to call ever since she came. It is said in Knightsbridge that Mrs. Braithwaite had a very great sorrow. I believe her favorite grandson died very suddenly, in some tragic way. She could not bear to live on where she had been living, and determined to come to the old Braithwaite place, which has been in her husband's family for generations. They have not occupied it for twenty-five years. She is said to be a little peculiar and entirely ruled by her maid, the Eliza you speak of, I suppose. I shall go in there immediately after Christmas, and one of you shall go with me, she added, turning to her sisters. Sydney privately wondered if Mrs. Braithwaite would welcome a call from her neighbor, whose somewhat chilling manner and stately precision of speech were so unlike the little lady's own impulsive ways. Mrs. Braithwaite, in spite of her years and her blindness, seemed like a warm-hearted, eager girl. The next excitement was the arrival by express of a big box which undoubtedly contained presents from home. This was, of course, not to be opened yet, but Sydney felt it and shook it over and over again, and had almost as much pleasure in guessing its contents as she did when she really looked at them on Christmas morning. In addition to her home gifts, she found to her delight that some of the girls had left little presents for her. There was a book from Dorothy Fearing, a pretty pincushion which Ruth Carter had made for her, and from Elsie a box of her favorite caramels and a dainty necktie. Even one or two of the other girls who had appeared to be less friendly of late had left Christmas cards for their fellow schoolmate, whose Christmas was to be so much less merry than their own. From Anne Talbot there was nothing. Dolly had begged her to give Sydney some little remembrance, even if it were only a card or a calendar, but she would not. I am not going to, said Anne, she has had lots of chances to explain things, and she won't. I was getting awfully fond of her, and I am very much disappointed in her, and now she acts so goody-goody. If she would fire up and have a scrimmage, I believe I should like her better, but she is just pleasant all the time, and yet looks awfully hurt. It is so maddening. No, Dolly, you needn't say another word. I simply won't. For Anne Talbot, there was no point of view but her own. She had not yet discovered that there are many ways of looking at the same subject. End of chapter 12 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 13 of The Friendship of Anne, a story by Ellen Douglas DeLand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When Anne Talbot reached New York that Saturday evening before Christmas, her mother was waiting for her at the station, and with hasty goodbyes to the other girls, she followed her to the carriage, and they were soon 
being driven to the beautiful house on fifth avenue where the talbots lived you dear dearest mother exclaimed anne throwing her arms about mrs talbot and kissing her i never was so glad to see anybody in my life how can you be so hard-hearted as to make me languish in boarding school you don't look very languishing laughed mrs talbot so far as i can tell in this light you are in a very bouncing state of health kingsbridge seems to agree with you in spite of the plain fare you tell me about you mustn't forget my dear that i too went to the wickersham school i know you are not being starved as you would have me believe wiki doesn't improve with age i dare say that twenty-five years ago she gave you terrapin and canvas back ducks but she doesn't now my good little mother no indeedy nothing but ham and corned beef and a few other horrors and ice cream only three times since school opened i hope you are going to give me ice cream for breakfast lunch and dinner and it must be mallards please and don't forget i am very fond of buckwheat cakes and have cream cakes always ready in the pantry anne does your mind run on nothing but eating is that all you have learned to talk about well it is all because wiki starves us oh how glad i am to be back in noisy old new york and what about the party mamma i have asked a lot of girls already and am to let them know which night the minute i can don't you think it would be great to have it new year's eve and sit up to see the old year out and oh mamma dear did bud bring home anybody for the holidays i am simply wild to know bud was anne's name for her only brother edward by which she had called him ever since the days when she could not talk plain and lisp buddy instead of brother she now heard to her satisfaction that two young men were visiting in the house and that one of them was fred merriman alec tracy's friend and that alec himself was coming in a few days they were classmates of ned's at harvard and were all in intimate the other guest was will dana whose home was in baltimore any girl can easily imagine what fun was in store for anne during these christmas holidays her father and mother delighted to have her at home were ready to grant her every indulgence that was in their power to bestow her brother a few years older than herself had always been especially devoted to her his friends liked her and were ready to do her bidding she was pretty and high-spirited full of fun and although inclined to be obstinate when her mind was made up as we have already discovered she was of a generous nature and if once convinced that she was in the wrong was always perfectly willing to acknowledge it the difficulty lay in convincing her just now she forgot all about sydney stuart and the affairs of school which so lately had been of such importance and was entirely absorbed in her preparations for christmas and the good times that lay beyond that day she never thought of sydney alone in kingsbridge whose affection for her was unbated in spite of anne's coldness and who longed with all her sensitive intense temperament to have her once more for a friend it is so hard to wait when you have an eager impulsive heart but mrs tracy had advised her to wait and she was honestly striving to be patient on christmas eve the talbot family of course hung up their stockings they not only hung them up but they filled them that is 
they provided the contents for one another's and this gave a grand opportunity for all sorts of jokes to be played as soon as dinner was over each member of the party went to his or her room and carefully placed a stocking distinctly marked with its owner's name by the fireplace where santa claus would have no difficulty in finding it when he should emerge from the chimney this accomplished they all returned to the library and if when they went to bed their stockings had disappeared from the fireplaces they made no comment santa claus had arrived earlier than was expected that was all and downstairs mr and mrs talbot filled the stockings with all sorts of odd-looking packages which had been collected and marked and after the household was presumably asleep again hung them where they had been left early in the evening now stuffed into grotesque shape and fairly bursting with their extraordinary contents christmas morning these were examined as early as each recipient chose to wake up and do it and loud were the shouts of laughter which came from every room after breakfast the whole family marched into the parlor the doors of which had been kept carefully closed and here were arranged a number of tables covered with white cloths and bearing the gifts which had been pouring into the house for many days and which were now to be opened anne's pleasure and enthusiasm reached their height when she found among her presents a charming little gold watch and chain from her father and mother and from her brother a ring which she declared was the prettiest in new york it was a band of gold set with turquoises and inside were engraved the words nan from bud christmas 1880 she had never worn rings before and as he slipped it on her finger she gave him a hearty hug you dear old boy she whispered did you choose it yourself of course i did i shall never wear any other ring as long as i live bosh are you going to decline an engagement ring i shall decline an engagement i'm not going to marry even if i am asked which is doubtful i am going to keep house for you and be the comfort of your declining years my dear girl exclaimed ned in pretended dismay perhaps i shall have provided myself with other comforts don't let your satisfaction in the ring lead you to make rash vows of remaining in single blessedness for my poor sake wretch you don't want me well bud i hope i shall like her if i don't if you don't you will have to hate her i know you nan however cheer up i haven't made my final choice as yet cheer up cheer up the worst is yet to come quoted fred merriman and i haven't thanked you you have been so engrossed with your presence and ned's future housekeeping i haven't had a chance that crimson soft pillow is a dandy it is just what my room needs i shan't let alec rest his golden locks upon it you may be dead sure of that that's the worst of a roommate they always grab all of a fellow's best cushions thanks ever so much and thank you freddy for your perfect basket you know my weakness for mallard's candy you must have broken yourself in two getting me five pounds in such a basket as that i shall always use it for a work basket what a picture murmured fred and darning stockings my basket beside her your candies following one another with fearful rapidity down her yawning throat put in ned bud how disgusting 
it sounds as though I were a young robin, but here is a package I haven't opened. Whom can it be from? It looks like Bertha Macy's handwriting, but I hope it isn't, for I haven't sent her anything. I never thought of her. She untied the ribbon and removed the wrapper. In it was a box, and in the box, laid in jeweler's cotton, was a shining bangle. Anne looked at it in astonishment. Then she discovered a card. It is from Bertha, she exclaimed. It is a perfect beauty. I had no idea she was going to send me anything. It is from Tiffany, too. She must have spent a lot on it. I wish she hadn't, for I don't think they have so very much money. Oh, I wish I had thought to send her something. The spirit of Christmas, observed Fred, to her that gives should be given. Well, it is true. I could still send her flowers or candy. I might fill a box from your basket just to punish you. Oh, and make you take them there. I will. Why don't you send her the basket just as it is? inquired Fred. Because I need it for my stockings. For no other reason, of course, I will get a basket. I have a nice little new one. She did so, and poured in the mallard chocolates with a ruthless and unstinting hand. If you haven't made fun of my darning stockings, I shouldn't have taken your candy for this, said she. Now I will do it up, and will you please get ready and take it as soon as you can. She lives in 37th Street. I will write the address. Let Banks or one of the maids take it, Anne, said her mother. Don't make Fred go away down to 37th Street. No, Fred, you shall not do it. Oh, Mamma, it would add ten times to Bertha's pleasure if Fred were to leave it there. She would be sure to see him, and she admires him as much as he does her. Fred groaned. No, he is not to go. Besides, he would not have time before church, and I don't like this idea of sending her something just because she sent something to you. You ought to have thought of it before. Well, I didn't, and indeed, Mamma, she will like it, and be awfully hurt if she doesn't get anything from me, and it is such a beautiful bangle. Mrs. Talbot examined it. Then she looked at the box. I haven't heard you speak of her often. Is she a great friend of yours? She asked. Oh, sort of a great friend. That is, lately I have seen more of her. She was at Cousin Gertrude's Thanksgiving party. I asked her, for Cousin Gertrude said I might bring some of the girls. She was a dandy choice, murmured Fred. I shall not soon forget my evening on the stairs with the fair one with the flaxen locks. Oh, boys are so queer, Mamma. You know, they don't think the way we girls do about other girls. Fred got stuck with Bertha, and so he has taken an awful prejudice against her, and so did Alec. Fred was about to make some retort, but he must have remembered in time that it was not in particularly good taste for him to criticize so freely a girl who was apparently Anne's friend, for having opened his mouth to speak, he closed it again, and placed his hand upon it with exaggerated caution, merely allowing himself to exchange a glance with Ned that was full of meaning. In the meantime, Ned had been examining the bangle. He laid it back in the cotton without comment. A little later, when he and Fred were together in another part of the room, he whispered, Imitation! Tiffany box! Quite emblematic of the giver, replied his friend. 
wait till you see her what does anne mean by standing up for her anne is usually pretty keen that way oh the best of us are influenced by undisguised admiration my dear boy see the result of your admiration of me i cannot live without you precisely returned ned dryly but i am glad it doesn't lead you into giving me tin presents in tiffany boxes i say nan hush up neddy let her find out things herself i'll trust anne any day to come to her senses just give her time and you know the more you oppose her the longer she will be in calming ground which remark proved fred merriman to be a wise young man and ned realizing his friend's sagacity turned the conversation and spoke to anne about something else when she responded to his summons so a pretty basket filled with fred's chocolates was sent to bertha and gave her great delight which was marred only by the suspicion that anne had not intended to give her anything until reminded of it by her own gift she did not allow this to worry her however and determined instead of writing her a note of thanks to call at the talbots the next day in this way there might be an opportunity for her to meet anne's harvard brother and also it might occur to anne to invite her to her party which she knew was to take place during the holidays and to which as yet she had not been bidden anne had spoken of it as being very small which while it accounted for bertha's having no invitation made her all the more desirous of being included among the favored ones bertha macy had friends of her own and might have been happy among them had she not been so carried away by her ambition to be counted among anne talbot's intimate friends she spoke of herself as one of them to her own admiring circle and she was willing to go to any length to procure herself an invitation to the house mr edward talbot was one of the leading men of new york and was well known in every quarter for his business ability his wealth and his benevolence mrs talbot was admired for her beauty and her kindness of heart but she was also said to be very exclusive there was little that the macy's did not know or think they knew about new york social life and they were keenly alive to the worldly advantages of being an intimate terms with the talbots therefore the day after christmas bertha donned her best clothes and at an early hour set forth to call upon her schoolmate the carriage was waiting in front of the house and it is to be feared that bertha's frivolous little mind was more deeply impressed than ever by the sight of the handsome horses the stately coachman in livery on the box and the groom who stood at the carriage door she told herself that she had come at precisely the right moment no doubt anne was going out in the carriage and might perhaps ask her to accompany her she tripped up the steps and rang the bell trying hard not to show her eagerness but to act as though she had been sounding the talbot's doorbell every day for years at the very moment that she did so the door was opened by the man and mrs talbot and anne came out oh bertha exclaimed anne i am so glad to see you but awfully sorry too for i am just going out with mamma mamma this is bertha macy she is at school you know mrs talbot shook hands with her cordially and no one would have suspected 
that she was surveying somewhat critically the girl whom she had heard discussed and of whom she was inclined by what she had heard and seen to disapprove mrs talbot would not have objected to an imitation bangle perhaps but she did not like imitation bangles sent in tiffany boxes however there was nothing in bertha's appearance this morning to arouse adverse criticism she was prettily and inconspicuously dressed in a suit of dark blue and her large blue felt hat with ostrich feathers looked very well over her fair hair i am so sorry i can't stay at home and see you continued anne but mamma has made an engagement for me at the dressmaker's and we are late now and afterward we have to do some shopping together but do come to see me again bertha i want you to see my christmas presents that was a lovely bangle you sent me i was going to write and thank you but now i can tell you and that was a perfect basket of candy you sent me exclaimed bertha i simply couldn't write you i just had to come and thank you for it how lovely of you to send me anything but i won't keep you now as you are going out you must come and see me anne i will if i can but the holidays are so short and there are such lots of things to do and then my brother is at home and some of his friends if i don't get to see you you will know it was because i simply couldn't and we will make up for it when we go back to school they were descending the steps as she said this and the groom had opened the carriage door she happened to glance at bertha and saw from the expression of her face that she was deeply offended Anne was as warm-hearted as she was impulsive so without stopping to give the matter a second thought or to consider what her mother's opinion might be she hurriedly added but i want you to come to my party bertha it is to be new year's eve we will send you a regular invitation but do keep that evening free won't you indeed i will cried bertha with undisguised delight i should just love to come and then the carriage door was slammed and the talbots were driven quickly away bertha walked down fifth avenue in a state of felicity that made her step upon the commonplace flagstones as though she were treading upon air and with so happy a face that more than one person turned to look at her a second time didn't i hit it just exactly right she said to herself exultingly if i had been two minutes later they would have been gone and i don't believe anne would have asked me it would have been awfully mean of her but i don't think she was going to do it my won't the girls in our set envy me just think of my going to a new year's eve party at the talbots and a small party too i'll have a new dress i certainly can't go in the one i wore to the tracys i just got to have a new one in the meantime mrs talbot and her daughter were discussing the situation and you know i don't care to have you invite guests to the house without my permission said she it surprised me very much to hear you you should have left it for me to do oh mamma dear i know you don't like to have me do it but i didn't stop to think you didn't see bertha's face she looked so disappointed about my going out and when i said there was so much on hand to do that i couldn't go to see her and then she knew about the party and that dolly and the others are coming she would have been terribly hurt to be left out and besides she was so good to send me that bangle 
Mrs. Talbot was silent for a moment. She had already decided to let Anne find out for herself what Bertha was, or what Mrs. Talbot suspected her to be, and after all she was not sorry that Anne was kind-hearted and ready to be friendly and hospitable to all of her schoolmates, without regard to their position in New York society. So she said no more. She herself was in no way influenced by wealth or social standing. She merely insisted upon good breeding and the genuine worth of those who came to her house. The affair of the bracelet had proved to her very clearly that these two qualities must be lacking in Bertha, but the girl appeared to be a lady in her manner of speaking and her dress, and after all it could do no possible harm to Anne or to any one for her to be present on New Year's Eve. End of chapter 13 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.